for years then we haven't even copyrighted our material we allow people to copy it to give it away that's what we want paul i gotta tell you you're not the only atheist or skeptic i've talked to the the real evidence doesn't matter and i know you'll use this against me yeah. well maybe Hello everyone and welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Apologies in advance for my sick guy voice, that's the way it goes sometimes. You may recall a few months ago, I was involved in a webinar with Creation Today's Eric Hovind. I think you're going to find it a fascinating talk. And dancers in Genesis, Tim Chafee. Hey Eric, thanks for having me. It's good to be here once again to talk about my favorite subject. To promote their DVD series. Hey guys, this Facebook Live is brought to you by Risen Without a Doubt. Which prompted me to make my first non-science video for the channel in response to what was presented there. While I don't actually expect you to remember, I recently learned that Tim and Eric remember. And remember the specifics. In fact, Paul, I think, said that um, in his uh, YouTube video about our uh, webinar. And Tim was right. I said exactly what he recalled. So how did we get here? Well, after the original seminar, I posted a Facebook question to Tim regarding the raising of many from the dead as recorded in Matthew 27, 51. We had a brief but pleasant exchange, and Tim let me know that he intended to write a blog post with a more complete answer to my question. Fair enough. As the months passed, I had opportunity to engage briefly with Tim on a few matters including some similar health history and Tim's foray into the world of comic book storytelling, which has been part of my career for a long time. All the while, Eric and Tim began increasingly frequent online hangouts to promote the series, which is a bit time-sensitive due to seasonal appeal. Things that have been brought out to try to come against what Christians celebrate the most. Christmas. Resurrection Sunday, which is coming up very soon. I jumped on a follow-up should Christians celebrate Easter hangout they had but mostly kept my mouth shut, as that question is more of an internal matter. But I couldn't help one innocent snarky comment. Paul said, waiting for the heathen price. If you will send me a message and you promise that you're willing to actually watch uh, Psy Strike and Paul, if you guys want these, I'll be more than happy to send this to you absolutely free. And he did it. Eric was true to his word and sent me the material. True to my word, I have watched it and considered it. In fact, it was my hope to have a full response video created by Good Friday. As such, I've kind of stayed away from the subsequent DVD promo hangouts as I thought the source material would be best to address. But then I got this notification from Tim to let me know that he too was good to his word and had finished his blog post on my mass resurrection question. I read the article and left some written feedback for him, but the next day I saw that Eric's Facebook Live topic was about the very question I posed, so I decided to jump on once again. All right, so I want to answer some questions. People have wondered about this. Did people really rise in Jerusalem when Christ died? Are there contradictions in the resurrection? What happens is a lot of times the skeptics will and critics will look at different biblical accounts and uh, they'll see what is an apparent disagreement where on the, the face of it doesn't seem like it lines up real well. And then right away they just claim, hey, here's a contradiction. You can't believe the resurrection. Uh, but let's let's back up a little bit before we deal with one. If somebody were to find a contradiction somewhere in the Gospels, Eric, would that disprove the resurrection happened? No, I don't believe that would disprove the resurrection had happened. What Tim just did there was an attempt to shift the burden of proof. For many claims, it is impossible to disprove them. For example, one could claim that unicorns exist, that there is a teapot orbiting the earth, that in a previous life they were a sea turtle named Molly. If you can't disprove it were the standard, then we would have to believe every ridiculous claim made, including contradicting ones. So, of course, we live our lives, or we should live our lives, reserving belief for that which has sufficient evidence for it. Tim's series, Risen Without a Doubt, makes the positive claim that Jesus rose from the dead. He says he has affirmational evidence. Now, if the best he can do is, you can't disprove it, then the resurrection of Jesus has no more weight than the existence of unicorns, Bigfoot, or wish-granting genies. Just pointing out that from the very beginning, their, their whole approach, even if they were able to show multiple contradictions, would not, it would not prove the resurrection didn't happen. It, all that it would do is call into question the records that speak about the resurrection. All it would do is call into question the records? Is that all? Well, given that the New Testament makes up the entirety of the case for the resurrection, and that so much of the argument is saying that we should take the Bible's supernatural claims seriously because of its track record on the non-supernatural claims, I'd say that's pretty devastating. If there are any errors in the Bible, how could anyone know which parts are mistakes and which parts are divine? Both of your ministries are solely dedicated to the authority of Scripture, even in the face of overwhelming scientific conflict. So that's a super weird concession. 
Now that said, having studied the Bible for decades, I'd have to agree with the general premise here that there are plausible enough explanations for the resurrection narrative variations to keep them from being definitive gotcha contradictions. It's a disturbing pattern, to be sure, but not a silver bullet. Since I would basically concede all these points to Tim, let's speed it along. Now, there's some that are more difficult, but let's start with an easy one. When start did with an easy one? Matthew tells us that the women went to the tomb as the first day of the week began to dawn. And when Matthew tells us that an angel would come down and roll back the stone and sat on it, Mark tells us it was very early in the morning on the first day of the week. So the day began dawn, Matthew, very early in the morning, pretty much the same thing, right? Um, Luke tells us that it was very early in the morning, and John tells us it was while it was still dark. So which one is it? Is it while it was still dark, very early in the morning? Uh, we've got a parent contradiction here. One of the people want to point out saying, I'm they're not all saying the same thing. Right, and so that's what the issue here. Um, now, really, for work in the morning, at this time of year, it is while it's still dark, or as the day begins to dawn, it is at each of those times. Um, but if we consider where the women were lodging, or at least most likely where they were staying, while it's specifically tossed, but uh, we know other times they stayed in Bethany, which is about one and a half to two miles away from where the tomb was, um, it's very likely that they set out, like John tells us, while it was still dark. The day had just, the sun had just come up. Um, and there's a pun in that. The sun had risen. Um, the sun had <laughs> risen. If there's one thing I don't miss, it's church jokes. Uh, so there's the S O N and the S U N. Yes. Okay, maybe it's unnecessary explaining of church jokes. Yeah, let's take a look at a couple more that are, are really quite easy. I'm going to share the screen again. <sighs> well, I'm not going to make you guys sit through any more easy ones. And if you're if you're a skeptic or if you're uh, an atheist on my page, what's the hardest one you know of, the contradictions that you say, here's a contradiction in the gospel about the resurrection account? Uh, Paul uh, on Facebook says this, Tim, the original ending of Mark had the women telling no one. Matthew and Luke had them sharing with joy. Here you have an apparent contradiction. Uh, what he's referring to the original ending of Mark. If you look in most uh, Bibles today, they'll, when you get to Mark 16, 8, uh, there will be a little break in the text and they'll say the uh, following verses are, are not included in the most, um, or in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts. Um, now, you know, some people believe verses 9 through 20 are original, but we've actually found at least three different endings to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, some people think that it just ends right at verse 8 and that there shouldn't have been anything else. And so the skeptics make a, a, they use this to say, well, see, there's no post-resurrection appearances and Mark is the earliest gospel is their assumption. Um, and that's you, that's uh, generally agreed upon by conservative and uh, liberal scholars. So they'll look at that and say, well, Mark never mentioned post-resurrection appearances. So as the other gospels were written, the legend grew, and then we got to start adding these post-resurrection appearances. Yes, yes, this exactly. When I was feeling lost in my faith, I made a four-column chart of the different resurrection details, which you can find in my blog if you're interested. The first column, Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, then John, the order in which they were written. Now, what stands out in the chart is not the differences themselves, but rather the tall tale escalation of the differences. The women said nothing. The women told the disciples. The women told the disciples who were standing right there. A man in a white robe. One man appearing like blinding lightning. Two men appearing like lightning. Maybe add in an earthquake. Maybe put Jesus himself in the room, or maybe outside in a disguise. Sure, artistic license on level of detail can cover for changes for those looking for assurance, but as an outsider, the pattern of story escalation, of legend building, fish story embellishment, is unmistakable. The details do not become more routine as the decades pass, they become more extravagant. Not a proof, but clearly a pattern, exactly what a growing legend would look like. In the spirit of a fair edit, I'll let Tim finish his point here. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So Mark, even in the first eight verses, is still telling us there's going to be post-resurrection appearances. Once again, the earliest writing is the most modest. For me, it's not that there are variations. It's that the variations are all in the direction of embellishment. Okay, what about this whole idea that when Christ died, there were people that rose out of the grave and walked around Jerusalem that's something that I'm sure a lot of people have questions about. Oh, hey, we're finally at my question. Let's revisit it, shall we? In reference to Matthew 27, 51, do you take this as literal, that many dead in Jerusalem were raised? If so, are there extra biblical references to this spectacular event? Seems like a big deal. Yeah, these dead people that walked around Jerusalem, it's something that I know skeptics wonder about. Christians wonder about this. Okay, is there any evidence of this? What happened there? This has uh, been rather controversial in uh, recent years. Uh, not just among skeptics, but also among uh, Christians, because uh, some people have started to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't take this in a very in a straightforward manner. Maybe what uh, Matthew is doing here is more of a literary device saying somebody very important just died because these the Gospels are written as Greek uh, biographies, BOA, and uh, it was very common in that day when somebody uh, famous passed away, uh, like Caesar or somebody else, that there would be 
astronomical events. There'd be other things that happened that uh, signified a great person had died. So uh, uh, Mike Lacona, who is a historian, said that um, you know maybe that's all Matthew was doing here. He's just following the uh, the, the way that um, the gospel, the way that BOAs were written, and he's just using this literary device to say a great person had died. I don't think that's necessarily the right answer. I, I think this that what Matthew describes here really did happen. So here's what it says: and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I think we all agree that is a strange event. Um, <laughs> if if we were there, this it would be rather shocking. And that's really the argument that the skeptic is making. How come Matthew is the only person that records this? I didn't actually ask about why Matthew was the only gospel writer who recorded it. Based on Tim's answer here and in the blog, either he thinks I did, or maybe I'm not the only skeptic in his life. Are we seeing other skeptics now? How come we don't have any other writings from anybody else in history who recorded this? Because surely this would have been the most amazing thing ever. Um, so why... Uh, why didn't anybody else talk about it? If there's a single thing that happened related to Jesus that should have been recorded by contemporary historians, it would be this. Comparatively, we can almost forgive history for missing Jesus' comeback, since it was mainly on the down low and just one guy. But this? Many holy people who died were raised to life? Many raised? They went into the city and appeared to many people? Not secret. Walking around in the city, many saw them. If this had happened, why would there need to be a disciple stole the body cover story? Just lump Jesus in with the rest of them. Why would Thomas have doubted? The ramifications of a super public mass resurrection are mind-boggling. And we have, even in our culture today, we have an abundance of news sources. And yet, if you watch the, the national news, if you watch the, the news network, only you know, a very tiny bit of things ever get discussed. All, all the rest of the stuff, they, they ignore anything that's not happening in New York or Washington, D.C., um, they ignore all sorts of things. Yeah, if a whole bunch of dead people came out of the ground and started walking around, say, Cleveland, I'm sure the 24-hour news teams would probably just keep reading political Twitter feeds. So why would we expect Roman writers living in Rome or anywhere else in the empire, not in Jerusalem, to write anything about this? Flavius Josephus, the most well-known Jewish historian of the time, who also happened to work for the Romans, grew up in Jerusalem and published at least 27 volumes. 27 volumes of Jewish history of the time and is our best source for life in Jerusalem prior to its fall in 70 AD. He included mundane details about life in Jerusalem, including clothing, food, scents, payments, and debts, but couldn't spare a single paragraph into 27 volumes to mention the day that many people rose from the dead and walked around the streets in plain view of everyone? Look, obviously absence of evidence is never evidence of absence. It just seems to me that of all the supernatural claims in the Bible, this one had the highest probability of external corroboration. But it has none. How do we know they didn't write things like this? Most writings don't survive that long. Yep. This is always the question I have when Christians claim that no one came forward to dispute the claims of the disciples. How do we know that they didn't? How do we know that the alleged witnesses didn't deny the whole thing and were tired of being misrepresented by the disciples? We don't. People don't fact check things now and they have Google in their pocket. And I can give a, an explanation as to why I think only Matthew out of the four gospel writers would mention it. This wasn't particularly important to me, but carry on. And it's because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. Over and over again in his gospel, Matthew says this was done so that this would be fulfilled, which was spoken through the words of the prophet, and then he explains what it was. So you see it in Matthew chapter 2, time and time again with the birth of Christ. This was done to fulfill the words of the prophet because his readers knew the Old Testament. This obvious agenda of the author of Matthew to connect up the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament makes me quite suspect of what was once my favorite book of the Bible. Not only were many of the connections a stretch that seemed pretty far-fetched even at the height of my belief, but it seems quite plausible that he was making up or misrepresenting Jesus' events in order to make them fit. Two of the most notable examples are times when the Greek translation of the Old Testament used by the author of Matthew, called the Septuagint, contained errors in the Hebrew to Greek translation, and he made the stories fit the translation error rather than the original text. The first is having Jesus awkwardly riding two donkeys on his way into Jerusalem, and the other is the potential fabrication of the entire virgin birth, where the Old Testament text reference really means young woman and not virgin. Based on what we do have, there were miraculous events that the, the temple veil torn into, the symbolism that that represented, all these things fit perfectly. Exactly right, Eric. But do they fit perfectly because they happened that way? Or do they fit perfectly because an Old Testament enthusiast was twisting and inventing facts to make a perfect fit? 
just like the events of Back to the Future 2 fit completely perfectly into the events of Back to the Future 1. Did the original writers know what was to come, or were the sequel writers just very familiar with the source material? Now, Christians have plausible deniability on these things, but they don't pass the smell test for an outsider. Let's, let's say that Mark, Luke, and John all talked about that. Do you think the skeptics would believe it, Eric? You know, I, that's a great point. I say no, because you look at all the external evidence for the, the, the crucifixion, uh, the Nazareth inscription that you've talked about in the series, and, and the many, many other extra biblical references to the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and they don't accept that. So to use this one and say, well, the Bible is your only evidence. I'm not going to believe it because you don't have any outside evidence. No, that you're not helping your case. You've already shown, and I, I'm try, sorry to be so blunt. You've already shown your prejudice. You've already shown that you don't want to believe no matter what the evidence says. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold the phone there, Eric. You just said, when you look at all the external evidence for the crucifixion. Well, there's not a lot, but there are brief, somewhat dubious mentions in Josephus and Tacitus. And guess what, Eric? I believe Jesus was crucified, entirely on the strength of that external evidence. I entertained a mythicist position for a while, the idea that historical Jesus didn't even exist, but I studied it a lot and eventually concluded that there was probably a historical man who was crucified, upon whom the movement was based. I came to general acceptance of a crucifixion because there seems to be sufficient external evidence. Then, in the same sentence, you conflate crucifixion and resurrection. The former is not the same as the latter. I've been through your seminar. There's no external evidence remotely as strong for the resurrection claim as the death claim. I'm sorry to be blunt, as you put it, but the Nazarene inscription is weak tea. It is super vague, and even at its most generous, isn't more than a plausible consistency. Now, Paul on Facebook says, that's disingenuous. Paul, I gotta tell you, you're not the only atheist or skeptic I've talked to. I have seen this over and over and over and over that the, the real evidence doesn't matter. But I have shown that my opinions and beliefs are swayed by evidence. I once again believe that at least one guy named Jesus lived in Jerusalem and died by crucifixion. Sufficient evidence. I assume if you had evidence like that for your resurrection claim, you'd have put it on the DVDs. But you didn't. If you're saving it, don't. Please present it. That's why I said, hang on, if you're if we're gonna if you're gonna try to disprove the resurrection of Christ. I'm not trying to disprove it because it's not falsifiable. Burden of proof, remember? Like you can't disprove wish granting genies. I'm just talking about the sufficiency of the evidence for our resurrection. So you're gonna say, look, all this evidence, and I sent you the thumb drive on this, all this evidence, I can dismiss all of that. You did send that, thank you. And now I definitely owe everyone a thorough discussion about why I didn't find it convincing. I'm not trying to be just disingenuous, Paul, not at all. I'm telling you from my experience and the experience of others uh, where the argument ends up going. Uh, despite all the external evidence for the resurrection of Christ. You just accused me, personally, of not being open to having my mind changed by evidence. But I just told you that evidence has me believing in a crucifixion. So which of us really holds an opinion without regard for evidence? I don't, I don't need, and, and, and I know you'll use this against me, but I don't need the external evidence because I've got the word of God. Boom. And you, Tim? I don't think it's disingenuous for me to say that the majority of skeptics would not believe even if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John agreed on it. Because we see time and time again, John Dominic Crossan doesn't accept the biblical accounts for the burial of Jesus Christ. And a lot of skeptics have followed his lead on that. They say, oh, Jesus is just buried in a shallow grave. In fact, Paul, I think, said that um, in his uh, YouTube video about our uh, webinar, he said the same thing. He said, that's what I typically hear has happened from uh, after Roman crucifixions, that they were buried in a shallow grave. Okay, but we've got four different writers that all say he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. How many writers? Now, I know that they want to try to dismiss some of them and say, well, they just borrowed from Mark, but you still have a couple of early sources that say he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So maybe two, with the second writing almost 100 years after the fact. So you have to deal with that rather than just completely dismiss it. And we definitely will. Video to come. To be fair here, Tim did reach out to me after the broadcast to let me know that due to the nature of the Facebook Live chat scrolling, he'd missed the context of my original statement. He even gave me some new-to-me non-biblical sources to look at. But still, there's this. Even if we could show them, hey, all four gospel writers talk about this, they still don't believe it. So to, to say how come the other ones didn't write about it, if you're not going to accept it if they did, then it is just disingenuous. And that's exactly why I didn't ask that question, Tim. With the Gospels essentially fruit from the same tree, the repetition count doesn't matter to me at all. 
nor likely to any skeptic. And that's why I was disappointed that so much of this session and your blog article focused on that point. A question that sounds like it probably came from the keyboard of a theist. Now, normally I let this next thing go, but I'm not feeling very charitable right now. So let's start with the definition of an ad hominem attack or an ad hominem fallacy. It is a logical fallacy in which an argument is rebutted by attacking the character, motive, or other attribute of the person making the argument rather than attacking the substance of the argument itself. When, of course, the motive of the person is not connected at all to the truth of their claim. A con artist might be telling you something true. A loving mother might be giving her child harmful advice. With that in mind... The skeptics bring it up because they're trying to discredit what scripture teaches about this event. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, who is he? He's going to return someday as judge. And I think really that is at the driving a lot of the uh, criticism of the Gospels. If Jesus was just some other person, if he was just an average guy, uh, I don't think that we'd even be hearing about him. I don't think the skeptics would care about him. But because he died and rose and he's our, our judge, then... Uh, that does concern them a great deal. So that's why we see the skeptics uh, a lot of times speak more about God and about Christ than than Christians do, which is really strange. But they're they're fixated on it because they're trying to get away from the, the reality. It's a matter of their bias. They don't want to believe what the Bible says about this event because, let's face it, if it happened, then Jesus is truly the Son of God and he's coming back to this world someday as judge. And we're going to be held accountable for our sins. So what you heard there was someone attacking their opponent's motives and not their opponent's arguments. If I were to say, for example, that the only reason someone might defend the resurrection of Christ is that they were indoctrinated into the belief from childhood, or that they make their livelihood selling DVD sets about the resurrection of Christ, so they need it to be true to pay their mortgage, then I would be committing an ad hominem attack. I would not be addressing the arguments honestly, but rather attempting to dismiss them by ascribing a negative motive. But I didn't do that and neither should creation today. I understand that their audience is almost entirely Christians looking for assurance that what they already believe is reasonable. So it's tempting to try to add to that reassurance by claiming that the only reason someone might disbelieve is because they're a filthy sinner who has been blinded by lust and or Satan. But if you claim that your show and your ministry is about providing truth and evidence, stop with the motive smearing ad hominem attacks. It's weak, it completely undermines the presentation of your position, and you guys are better than that. If you really have the truth, that's enough. We've got a much bigger issue that you and I need to talk about that about, and that is, what is truth? If you're saying that the Bible doesn't get it right, that the Bible is not true, what is truth? We got to figure that out and have a discussion about that before we can ever get to whether or not the resurrection really happened or whether that event is true historical. Given that I've taken the time to produce an entire YouTube channel dedicated to pointing out where I feel you and your guests have strayed from the truth, I'd obviously welcome that. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, skeptics and atheists, for the wonderful, kind encounter. I always appreciate that. And look forward to seeing you guys on another uh, Facebook Live. Maybe not after this one, but I hope so. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you didn't. Leave me a comment below, let me know what you thought. Did I go too far? Am I way off the mark? Or maybe just wish me a speedy voice recovery. To be sure you don't miss any new Polygia movies, please click subscribe and maybe that notification bell as well. Thanks for listening. Later.